Hi, Ho. Uh, welcome to Magnets. Um, so we have a 20 to 25 minute presentation uh, where your microphone can be kept muted. Uh, uh, time for questions after that. Um, and uh, finally, there is a there is a time for catch up, which is now recorded. So today I'm really, really happy to have Ben Weiss uh, presenting um, a seminar or entitled Oriented Bedrock Samples Drilled by the Perseverance rover on Mars. So now, Ben, please uh, share your screen. The floor is yours. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Thanks for coming. Thanks, you guys, for continuing this really cool seminar. Got us all through the pandemic. Um, can everybody see that fine? Yes, thank you. Right. Cool. So yeah, tonight I'm going to tell you about how we're acquiring the sort of first, really, really the first oriented bedrock samples from another planet other than the Earth, their planetary body, really, since we didn't even do it from the moon. And these are going to be really awesome for paleomagnetism and rock magnetism. So that's why I decided it would be nice to give this talk to this group of people. Um, so we today Mars is uh, cold and dry. Average surface temperatures are minus sixty five Celsius. The surface pressure is so low that even if you got up to zero C, water will go straight from ice to gas. It's below the triple point, and so you know it's mostly considered to be an at least an uninhabitable inhabitable place on the surface. Um, but what you can see from pictures like this taken in 1976, we've long known that Mars, early Mars was a very different place. So you can see these fresh craters here with these sharp rims and that are not degraded. Uh, here's another one over here, kind of superimposed on this background population of heavily eroded, soft rimmed, flat to bottom, shallow craters that are dissected by these spectacular dry dry so-called valley networks which indicate that ancient water was apparently flowing on the surface so you know one of the biggest questions in mars science is how did this happen when did it happen and and you know was early mars really warm and wet and, and potentially even habitable or even inhabited one of these uh craters is shown here in a higher resolution from the high rise image this is the jezero crater a 50 kilometer crater in Northeast Sirtis. And what you can see here is that you could barely see the crater because it's so filled up. You can see also this inlet valley here, the Nervo Vallis coming in, making this what looks like a fan and out on the right, it's spilling out on the other side. It's like it filled up with a bathtub and actually flowed out the other side. So this is a very, very different ancient environment than what you'll see in a second, it looks like on the surface today. So I'm going to zoom into this little area here, and this is the landing site of the Mars 2020 mission, the Perseverance rover, whose purpose is to co basically collect samples and ultimately bring them back to Earth for analysis in our laboratories for the first time from Mars. So here's a close, a close in of that box. This is a false color image where I'm trying to show you now um, the, the minerals that are present here. So you can see green and blue colors are spectrally labeled to indicate carbonate. We are just now exploring this green unit, which has been a, one of the main targets for the mission. Um, it's been hypothesized to be potentially a lacustrine carbon, among many other things. Um, and there's orange, olivine, and purple orthopyroxene. So there's a big spectacular fan at the end of this um, uh, dry valley net, a dry, uh, um, river. Uh, yeah, dry valley network and using the wrong term. Sorry, I was up late last night. My flight got in at two in the morning. So um, with, after a six hour delay, so forgive my voice. Um, and so what you see here is that <clears throat> what we've learned is that there is a, a dry, uh, basically a sedimentary fan, what's likely on top of uh, a, igneous lava flows in the crater floor here. So a spectacular variety of different lithologies for us to explore. And then outside the crater um, is the most ancient terrain on Mars, going back to about 4.5 billion years ago. All right, so um, why did Mars transition from what apparently warm and wet to cold and dry place? There's lots of different ideas. 
Most of them relate to the loss of the atmosphere, either into the ground or into space. And one of the ideas for why Mars lost its atmosphere to space is that once it had a magnetic field, we know that, and that that magnetic field served potentially as a shield for the atmosphere. And when it um, died, basically, the solar wind electric and magnetic fields potentially could have stripped off the atmosphere by sputtering or, or um, solar wind or basically ion pickup. That's the, there are other ways the atmosphere can interact with the atmosphere. It's even possible that it, it couldn't, I'm sorry, the magnetic field could interact with the atmosphere. It's even conceivable or not beyond conceivable. It's likely that in some, depending on the planetary magnetic field strength could actually lead to enhanced atmospheric loss. So this is a pretty un, poorly understood um, process from a theoretical perspective, but it remains um, one of the leading ideas for why Mars basically lost its atmosphere and became inhospitable is that this may have been driven by the loss of an early dynamo that once protected it. And we'd love to test that idea with samples. So just to you know whet your appetite a little more, the timing of the dynamo is uncertain, and that would certainly be a key goal for uh, future studies. Um, and its intensity is largely unknown, but it does seem to overlap with an error or precede this this era of valley network activity. So, in that sense, uh, it's the fact that it likely preceded it, based on our current knowledge, leaves open the possibility that its loss was causal in the in the loss of the early atmosphere. So. Um, this has been, uh, you know, something that people have thought about a long time, and I think we're really going to be able to make serious progress on this in about 10 years when the samples come back. So just to show you what we're expecting here, we have this mafic floor that I mentioned um, between 2.2 and 3.5 billion years in age. We don't know that quite. This is based on crater counting, but it's, you know, roughly on the Earth Proterozoic to Archean in age. And then we have this sedimentary fan about 3.7 to 3.9-ish. And then another um, unit, kind of um, uh, enig enigmatic unit called the olivine carbonate unit, which is, is variably been attributed to be igneous or sedimentary in origin or even lacustrine in origin. That's even older. And then beyond the crater rim, you know, is basically the earliest known rocks from Mars and basically rocks that we don't even have access to really on our own planet in terms of that deep time. So you see basically in this, you know, 20, 30 kilometer stretch that you see right here, there is, you know, basically 2 billion years of, of rocks, essentially, that we could take samples of and bring back. So quite spectacular. Okay, and, and um, this just shows you how they relate to the timing of the dynamo, or expected timing of the dynamo. You know, they should almost certainly post-date the dynamo and potentially even predate the dynamo, depending on when it turned on. So we really have the opportunity if we could sample these units to um, basically determine the dynamo's onset and decay times and its, its intensity. But like as most paleomagnetists know, you know, you need to do paleo intensity measurements to determine that particular goal. But you know, we would love absolutely oriented samples because after all, determining the age of the magnetization in, in a rock greatly benefits from, you know, field studies like conglomerate tests and fold tests. And so we would love, love, love to have directional data on these samples just for this particular goal, not to mention all the things you can do with paleo directional data that are not related to the timing of the dynamo, which I'll mention in a second. All right. So awesome news is there's bedrock everywhere on the surface. And here's an example. Um, this is from the, uh, olivine carbonate unit. That's actually a abrasion patch that we 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 uh, produced and which we used for our high res our close up in, um, instruments to basically high resolution mineralogical and compositional maps. Um, and we've sampled this in two places here. So we've got in two nice samples of, of olivine carbonate, um, olivine rich cumulate here. Here's a, a sedimentary rock from the fan. This is the fan more beautiful fractured bedrock. We've got two samples there, my, my geek and Shu Yak. Um, and then this is the worst example of bedrock we, we've sampled. Um, basically, it doesn't look like much. It turns out that if you were to zoom in here, you can see the, and stretch it, you can actually see layers underneath that, that uh, SID rock down here on the right. 
and these dip and uh and are exposed elsewhere outside the frame of this view in, in a similar attitude and so we're we have high confidence that even hahoni is likely um a sample of bedrock so basically we've gotten almost exclusively samples of bedrock so far from the mission which i'll talk about in a minute all right so what why would we want to do this um, why would we want uh, bedrock samples? And this is the, the we, don't, we don't just want bedrock samples. We want absolutely oriented um, samples of them, right? So we we uh, want to be able to know the absolute orientation of of these samples in basically Martian geographic coordinates. So here I'm here for the in the Magnet Z seminar because uh, you know we're all interested in paleomagnetism. And there's tons of wonderful things we'll be able to do with these samples from a paleomagic perspective. So I've already mentioned the history of the Martian dynamo and its causal connection um, to um, the loss of the Martian atmosphere, which we would love to have field tests of stability to constrain the sample's ages. But then, you know, we can, because uh, remnant magnetism is so sensitive to being reset or, or changed by thermal and aqueous alteration, um, we actually can use paleomagnetism to um, understand those processes, which are really, really interesting from um, the perspective of other potential uh, sample science goals that we might apply to the sample. So for example, we wanna look for fossils in these samples. That's the key goal of the mission is look for, for fossils. And we'd love to know their preservation state and paleomagnetism might tell us that by looking at the uh, alteration history, whether it was, you know, if they were altered in situ or prior to their deposition, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, an obvious application is tectonics. Did early Mars experience true polar wander or plate tectonics? We could potentially do that by um, basically measuring the remnant magnetization of samples through time and understanding something about the uh, the paleo latitude. That'll be it. And then we could even start uh, the beginnings of of, of a Martian uh, magnetostratigraphic time scale if the Martian magnetic field reversed. We'd look for reversals and. And maybe even use them also um, to to for stratigraphy and, and as well as to understand the um, evolution of the Martian dynamo. But there's lots of stuff beyond paleomag. Just a few examples of other fields that'll benefit from oriented samples. Understanding the absolute oriented orientation of um, textures and sedimentary rocks is actually an indicator of biogenicity. There's a famous example recently of reported. Um, stromatolites from Greenland, Isua, Greenland, it, and but uh, 3.7 billion years old. But it turns out some of those stromatolites are cones that are pointing down. And so um, that was a kind of a, a piece of evidence that led a number of people to reject that idea that these are actually, in fact, stromatolites rather than deformational features, just a simple example. And of course, sedimentology loves um, oriented samples or at least measurements of of, of uh, sedimentary textures in, in 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 absolutely oriented so you can determine paleo current directions you can turn very from uh you know cross bedding variations in flow energy from great changes in grain size as a function of stratigraphic position et cetera et cetera et cetera and there's also a lot of volcanology stuff that i haven't mentioned here that's also really fun okay so um before we i'm gonna i'm gonna show you how we um ended up being able to orient the samples so we uh when we when we when i joined the mission there was not any requirements to to orient the samples there wasn't really a plan to do so it just wasn't a central part of um the key science objectives that the mission identified so that's sort of the main thing i and um eli mansbach who is basically a, um equal co-author here first author and a large group of people whose names you'll see at the end We've been working on for the last two years is how to actually do this um, and then um, and then actually apply it to the sample. So here's the rover. I'm going to be mentioning the coring drill in a second. That's what's taking our samples. It's on that's on the end of this arm here. And then we've got a really cool microscopic. It's like a hand lens we call Watson on, right there, too. And then you'll see a bunch of images from different cameras, mass cam Z and front has cams. And then what what we basically do here uh, is we're orienting different parts of the rover using their own internal coordinate system. So the coring drill has its own coordinate system. Watson has its own coordinate system. And the rover itself has its own body coordinate system. And a lot of the, what we're doing here is basically acquiring engineering data from different parts of the rover 
and then rotating them into each other's reference frames. And the process we're doing that is use involves the use of so-called quaternions, which may be familiar to some of you and not to others. We're not, we don't typically use them in paleomagnetism, but they're these four-dimensional extension of complex numbers, which allow you to do with simple multiplications, rotations of 3D vectors into different coordinate systems. All right, so um, we are, this is the, the drill here. It's a rotary percussive drill. It's um, it got two stabilizers on either side that basically extend out and hold it down on the rock. It's pointing up here. Usually, obviously, we point it down at the outcrop. And it takes um, cores that are, you know, roughly 70 millimeters long, 13 millimeters wide. Here it is in action on the SID rock, the one I showed you earlier, the worst example of bedrock that we've um, drilled. And here you can see the stabilizers and the core bit, coring bit, just as just at the end of coring here. And what we've basically found, uh, here, let me show you a video actually, if you can see it in action. So this is basically a GIF of um, the whole time that we did this. All right, so that's that that is the um, that is the full video. You can see it's basically very rigid; it doesn't wobble at all. We've can basically uh, shown that it wobbles less than 0.1 degree during the whole process. So here's probably the most important statement I'm going to make about how we did the core orientation, which is we basically orient the coring drill itself and use that as a basically direct indicator of the the um, orientation of the core, at least its pointing vector, because it's essentially drilled straight into the rock here. So the beautiful thing about this is that because the rover needs to understand its own orientation very precisely to do this, in particular of the, of the coring drill, we have very, very good uh, engineering information about the coring drill's orientation that we can use for core orientation. Of course, that won't get the role of the core, and I'll come back to that in a second. All right, so this is the process. This is the quantities that we need. Um, we have Martian horizontal plane here, defined by Martian north and Martian east, Martian down. These are all three right-handed coordinate systems. We've got some core drilled at some angle into there. Um, it's got a pointing vector along its uh, into the outcrop, and what we call the core y vector, which points basically up slope of the of the coring plane, which is perpendicular to that core pointing vector. And you know, to orient that um, core pointing vector, we need two angles, as most of you are familiar with. We need its aid, which is 90 minus its dip, and we need its, its azimuth here, which is the projection of that core y vector into the, the horizontal plane. OK, and then we also need, because the core can spin along that pointing vector, we need this some indicator of its, what we call I've called the roll. We don't typically use this term in, in field paleomagnetism because we just mark the top. But it's not so straightforward to do that on Mars. So we actually we basically need the angle of that core relative to some sort of reference direction that we have on the core, which I've shown here as a green arrow, the the angle between core Y and that green sort of fiducial direction. All right. So as I said, we're basically going to get the first two of these from uh, assuming basically knowing the coring drills, Admus and Hade. Um, and here is uh, the core. The way we do the core roll is we take an image of the outcrop here with a, this is using the Watson camera. Um, the core was drilled at this dashed circle location here. And then we can basically, because we know the orientation of Watson, um, we can figure out which way core Y is, that the upslope direction in the core plane in this image using those quaternions. We also know the direction, Watson Y here is basically the, direct, the direction of the Watson Y axis, which is the, towards the top of the plane. And so we can basically measure those angles. And then the whole point is that because we have this picture, as long as they're natural asymmetric, rotationally asymmetric markings on the surface, we can use those as um, a fiducial uh, indicator and um, of this image, essentially. So the sample will come back. We'll just open it up in the lab and photograph it and then basically match the photograph with this uh, Watson image. And then we'll know exactly which way core Y is in this, and, the, and, the, and be able to mark the role. We use the roll to mark core Y. Okay, here's a most, turns out all but two samples of the 15 that we've driven drilled so far have, have enough basically a natural asymmetric markings. A couple of them turned to be, were so covered with dust that we couldn't rely on it. And so we, after a lot of discussion in the team, we managed to develop a very simple system where we use this laser 
on this instrument called SuperCam, which is mainly for uh, lots of for elemental analysis and spectroscopy. But uh, we use the laser to actually mark um, on the core surface an asymmetric feature, and we can use that to uh, as our fiducial marker when we get the sample back. So we made a little pattern of L, uh, L pattern out of three sets of laser shots shown here. And uh, someone wrote a little blog piece about this and a bunch of um, news, news places called it the first letter to be engraved on Mars. Um, but for us, it's just, you know, mainly a, a um, orientation indicator, not some cryptic uh, message to future Martians. Okay. Um, you, of course, this uh, all if this role is gonna this role method is gonna work. Um, this, the cores need to hold together, and you can see here that uh, at least for sandstone and basalt, and maybe even tuff, it's gonna do pretty well. We think these are test bed drills of rocks on Earth using the Mars twenty twenty test bed, but we don't anticipate it's gonna be at nearly as good for. Um, gypsum, mudstone, things like that, as you can see here, turns into a bunch of Neko wafers. So we'll, may, we may only get the very upper part of the core rotationally oriented in, for some of these materials. We'll just have to see. We're hopefully going to have them x-rayed uh, before they're taken out of the tube so um, we can at least reassemble their orientation using puzzle piece fitting together, um, at least down some depth into the core here. I see, Yeah, okay. So this is a kind of a a family view of some of the samples we've taken. There's now, like I said, we're up to 15 here. Uh, let's see how many we have here. There's, we have more, we have actually more than this. It's 15 unique samples, but um, this is so this is just, a, uh, and there's many of them are doubled. So this is just some of the um, samples that we've gotten from the first part of the mission. And um, to summarize, so we've got, uh, sorry, this is this. That's the problem with this. I didn't update that. It's actually 22. That's why I was getting confused there. So we have 22 cores that we've drilled, all but two from in place bedrock. Um, and this is going to be a wonderful suite for um, anything that requires um, orientation because we have them oriented now to better than 2.6 degrees, three sigma uncertainty in absolute space. So we'll hopefully be able to start studying things like the the um, tectonics on Mars, it's magnetostratic, which we're looking for reversals. We really want to determine the lifetime of the Martian dynamo um, and test its hypothesis in the evolution of the Martian atmosphere. Um, and yes, this is the first time we'll build this on another body. And we have a paper we've submitted to the special collection for the Mars 2020 Western campaign. It's a, a bunch of JGR, ESS, GRL, AGU advances special issue collection. Um, and I'm happy to um, take any questions. Let me thank um, all the people who've been involved in this. So I mentioned Eli Monsbeck, who's the co-first author, and lots of different people around the world here um, from JPL, including uh, also engineers and scientists. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Ben. So give a big round of applause. <laughs> Thank you very much. Very, very interesting talk. Thank you. There is now room for questions from the audience. If anybody has a question, you can raise your hand or you can tap it in the chat. I can read it out. Win. Win has a question. You go ahead. I win. Hi, Ben. Great talk. Thank you. Uh, I noticed that sort of the critical time uh, from those three different rock sequences that you have uh, of, was it 2.5 uh, billion years? Those are mostly sedimentary sequences. How are you going to get reliable pillion intensities from the sedimentary sequences? Great question. Um, I don't expect that we will, you know. Um, only what I expect, the only reliable pale intensities we might get from these, uh, well, we'll get lower limits on the intensity, presumably from, you know, the DRM or whether the, whether they carry a CRM or a DRM is unclear right now. They, they almost certainly don't, we're not metamorphosed, so we can't hope that they are carrying a TRM that we could use for a robust pale intensity estimate. Um, unless there's something lucky with a 
even then it would probably be a later impact melt from this crater of Belva here. I can show you, uh, let me go back in a second. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so we don't, I expect that these either have a CRM and a DRM or some combination thereof. They probably have both. So we'll probably only have a lower limit on the paleo intensity, which is still good for this purpose. Mm -hmm. they, they also have, this is a really interesting thing that I'm just starting to um, write up, is that they have um, detrital grains in them that are derived from outside Jezero. And the, many of those, I would expect, you know, we might be able to, might have a TRM that's still intact, but that would be a more ancient um, thermal remin remnants than the, this critical period that you identified. You know, I would take these, the other thing I would say is these ages that should be taken with a gigantic boulder of salt because they're based on um, extrapolation of crater counting ages, which even when you can do that perfectly has uncertainties of hundreds of millions of years. But in, in particular, the problem with doing it here is these are very small units and they've been deflated so that the surface has basically been ripped away and exposed, you know, essentially eroded for billions of years by wind. And so um, many of the craters have been lost. And uh, how, so these ages are, have, are greatly uncertain just from that perspective alone. So it might you, turn- you get, you get a better date when you get the samples, right? Yeah, they're, they're, that's, a, that's a central goal is to do geochronologies. So this, you know, critical 3.7 to 3.9 window that you zeroed in on, that could easily slide into the mafic, you know, I don't know, that could go into the olivine carbonate, no problem, you know what I mean? So I'm, I'm not sure that this, or it could even, the whole thing could all be off by hundreds of millions of years systematically. So this is sort of a notional um, bunch of ages, but it will be, I think you're, I want to just do emphasize your point. We really do need igneous rocks to do this, to get actual paleo intensity as well. So hopefully we'll work, that'll work out. We also, I should say, niliplanum is, basically unknown it's terra incognita and there's probably an there we know there's an incredible diversity of rocks out there and, that, and many many most of them are probably igneous but not all and i would expect that we're going to see a lot of rocks out there that maybe potentially are, are you know from the late late end of the dynamo lifetime that we we think we've inferred from the um from orbit right amazing project uh, ben really amazing thank you so much thank you um, any other question from from the audience? Well, one thing I just just say I want to say oh. quickly, I forgot to mention. So these samples, we don't know exactly when they're coming back. They're baseline for 2033 right now, but that may change depending on the budget. Um, but they are going to be a community, you know, they are a community resource the way the Apollo samples are. So this is something that, you know, the whole community should and I w will be able to participate in, which is you know one of the reasons I wanted to give this talk. So this is really something that we can all think about working on. Yeah. Amazing, thank you. Anita? Hey, hey yes, hi, Laurie. Yes, hi, go Laurie. Ahead. Yeah, Ben, Laurie Brown here, very Hello. interesting. Let me ask you a little bit about the actual drilling. So yes. this is dry drilling. Yes. And how deep, how long a course are you being able to extract? They had 70 centimeters. Typically they vary depending on the hardness of the rock and, and stuff like that. Yeah, and they don't get hot, which might, was I thought you were gonna ask next. Um, yeah, right, that's what I was thinking about. <laughs> yeah, that's, fortunately there, are, this is the first time I've been involved in a project where another scientific group carries more about the temperatures than me. Um, so like, there are people who are worried about you know, there's a huge community of people all over the world from many different disciplines who want to study these samples. And amongst that huge community are people who really want to study these uh, sulfates, salts, things with fluid inclusions, um, basically very volatile, um, you know, chemical sediments that will be, you know, change their mineral structure at like 50 degrees, 60 degrees Celsius. <laughs> And so we don't expect these things to be above 60 Celsius from the entire, entire sampling process all the way to their arrival on Earth. And so the drilling is very gentle in terms of temperature. Great, thanks. Thank you. Now, Courtney, I see your hand up. Hi, Courtney. Hey, yeah, that was really cool. Um, I know my colleague here at UF, Amy Williams, is a little worried yes. 
right now oh. about the current state of funding for the return mission. Um, do you have similar worries? Yeah, well, there's the, there's a very big concern about that. Yeah. So then, as some of you guys might know, there was this um, there's a budget this year that's supposed to be significant for Mars sample return, which is the follow up two missions that will pick up the samples and bring them back to Earth. So not Mars 2020 itself. And they've got they they project that their cost is going to be higher than um, what they originally thought. And so there's you know not clear that the Senate is very happy about that. So there's been a study by an independent review board, which you can find online now. They just opened it about a week ago, um, which says you guys got to get your cost under control. Um, and so there is the, the question now as to how they're going to do that and then how the Congress will respond in terms of, you know, basically providing them the funding they need. So we're kind of in a critical time, probably one of the most critical times for the sort of funding of the mission. And, and this is, you know, I guess serendipitous in the sense that I'm talking to you guys right now, but what's really a critical piece that we, that the IRB uh, called out as being needed right now that's missing is advocacy from the scientific community um, in favor of our sample return. And, and this is actually something that I've been thinking about a bit because, you know, it, it, it's, it, Mars sample return is a large budget item. Um, and, but it doesn't cross cut all of planetary science today. So there are people who use, you know, orbital spectrometers. There are people who take images from orbit. There's all kinds of communities that don't necessarily work on samples. And so um, it doesn't directly benefit those communities. On the other hand, it benefits huge communities that are not, you know, traditionally um, thought of as that may not right now be in planetary science, not to mention all the decades of people in the future who will analyze these samples over, you know, next hundred years who aren't, who aren't represented. So I think it'll it certainly just like the Apollo samples will bring in all kinds of people who, you know, would love to, have been always been interested in this, but basically, you know, we didn't have the right venue to get involved in sort of planetary science. You know, like Paleomanctus, I consider myself one of those people, right? But I think there's a lot more people out there in our community, I feel like, that would, you know, be able to do wonderful things with these samples, with all the things they've done on Earth. And, and it's really, it, it would be very helpful um, for that, for these, you know, these broader communities to understand the significance of this. So that wasn't why I'm giving the talk. We decided this, you know, nine months ago, but it turned out to be, you know, very well timed in terms of this particular issue. So thanks for bringing that up. Is there any way, like, those of us in the community can reach out to this committee? Um... A very good question. Let me, yeah, I didn't think about that. Since I'm, I'm not in the leadership of it, um, you know, okay. I, I'm not courting that. But I think one thing they will be doing. It's probably having some conferences um, in the near term to to like and and uh, I think general scientists I think yeah it's a good question that I don't I don't have a specific answer to but um, you know the, the they always say the simplest thing of you know supporting your you know if if you interact with your local congressperson and things like that to be supportive but I'm not, there's got to be more than that that I, but right now there's they're just starting to I think ramp this um, campaign up so if I find out some more information I'll let you know. Like for example, yeah. uh, there's a the conference or uh, another. You know, I think there will be. I'll, I'll like pass that on to the um, GP Mag list. Would be a good place for that. For example. Great, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. And once the this uh, webinar is online, you can also post the link on a YouTube uh, underneath the YouTube, and people can get updates. <laughs> thank you. And so, any other questions? Seem to be. Can I ask another it. question, Anita? Of course, win. <laughs> it's just uh, <laughs> fascinating. Uh, I mean, gosh, people would die to get their hands on these samples. Uh, but with all the technology that and the cost of uh, doing that, I wonder if, I mean, did anybody think about trying to put together a kind of a spinner magnetometer or something that you could, or was that just a step too far? I know you want the samples back in it for all sorts of other reasons to look at the mineralogy and the geochronology. Everything. Yeah, there has been discussion about that. Actually, I had a proposal funded to do that by myself, um, and um, we, you know, we ended up just basically deciding that that was, you know, 
in terms of complexity, you know, a very, very expensive pr proposition. It's better to do. I, I think there's a, before we do that, there's a lot of, there's, you know, ground or helicopter, you know, rover, helicopter, magnetic exploration is likely to happen first. So there are a bunch of people thinking about that. Um, that's what we ended up concluding. We ended up proposing to put a magnetometer actually on this rover. So they declined that. Um, but, you know, it's fortunately, I, you know, I think having the samples back is going to be fantastic anyway. So I think the samples in a terrestrial laboratory, it's going to be hard to, to beat that. And only, but having a, you know, bringing a payload to the surface of Mars being so expensive, it's not super, you know, it's not usually in the budget of a typical discovery mission, for example. So there just aren't a lot of opportunities for reasonable cost to bring, bring something like that to the surface. Um, but I think at some point that's going to have to happen because like, you know, having a, like a mobile Martian paleomag laboratory, that's, I mean, it's sooner or later. <laughs> well, we're still waiting for a manned mission to Mars. Yeah. What's that? We can still hope for a manned mission to Mars. A little right, right. That's true too. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, amazing stuff. Yeah. Thank you. So the uh, collecting oriented samples is really fundamental, not only for paleomagnetists. I was wondering if you were thinking of actually taking oriented blocks with the same very clever system you came up. Block sampling? The... Yeah, like blocks. With the rover? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I and mean, they would never let me do that. Uh, or uh, they, I don't think the rover can't do that. <clears throat> and then even if it could, it wouldn't be able to stick it in the what there's this thing called the os it's like a i have, I have to sh it's hard to describe but imagine a sphere with a bunch of core like you just put it underneath your drill press and like drill press it with like 30 core holes in a kind of hexagonal grid that's basically the thing that's going to be taking the samples back to earth and so you can't fit a block sample in there very easily so that would yeah that would drive and like engineering rover engineers crazy and every step of the you know banging the rover against the rock face to trying to shove it into a round hole <laughs> so yeah we're and maybe the point being you know we're definitely limited in material here like mass right so it's going to be a different type of paleo egg um than we're tip used to we have 30 samples and that that needs to feed the whole world for decades. Um, we're going to be basically it's going to be micro sampling. It's going to be you know um, high sensitivity magnetometry. You know the good thing is this is probably at least another ten years off, and then you know maybe decades of work. So I think the magnetometers by then are going to be amazing, and so and as well as the micro sampling and handling tools. So it's a little bit intimidating right now. I mean, it's sort of, you know, in our capability now and that we, you know, people who work on meteorites are kind of used to that. But, you know, in terms of that, that being, that capability spreading out, becoming more common, and also the sample mass going down, which it may still have to, that, you know, we've got, fortunately, a decade or more of that to, um, to prepare for that. And I think there'll probably, you know, be funding available. I'm not a representative for NASA here or any other agency. It's just me speculating, um, you know, to basically upgrade laboratories to receive these things. That's usually, that's what happened with Apollo and what's happened with the Hayabusa mission and with the um, OSIRIS-REx, which just landed on Sunday. Um, so there's usually a, you know, funding available to basically get the instrumentation to make, to make the sample measurements. Is a very important uh, point. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I hope we really can can get these samples back. I guess yeah. I had another question that is a practical question. When you go in the field, sometimes the samples get stuck inside the drill bit. Yeah, I hope it never happened. But what would happen? What I know it's do? been my. I've been like before we landed. I was sure that was going to happen. It's going to be a disaster because I have. I'm a I'm a bad driller, so that happens to me all the time. And then like, yeah, how do you get it out, right? But that happens when that happens. <laughs> and then the process of taking it out and caching it into the in the rover body is an incredible, I, I could show the video if you're interested, but it's like a insane, like multi, you know, like 30 step, I don't know how many pro process of involving a bunch of all these different complicated motions of various 
you know, devices inside the rover body to get it out and put it away. And that's also a you know, very complicated process by itself. So we've never gotten really the um, sample stuck in, in, the, in the core. There has been a couple of times where there's like a little rock that we saw sitting on the surface of the, around the, of the rover near the this, this system where we ingest it into the um, rover body that even just seeing something like that, you know, basically caused the mission to stop for, you know, until they can understand what was going on or went away. So um, there have been a few sort of anomalies in that sense, but they have been relatively minor in the end. And either the rock just disappeared eventually, or they moved the, the gears a little bit and it went down in the hole, it was like little fragments. But nothing like, you know, like what I typically experience, have experienced in the field where it's like you have to bang the, you know, drill bit and get it out, shake it. <laughs> Somehow they've managed to design it so it doesn't do that. That's very great. <laughs> they invested, you know, many, many years and lots of money in making this drill. It's a really impressive device. It would be nice to see the video. I don't know if you can post it later. Okay, I'll see if I can find it, yeah, <laughs> while we're talking. I don't know if I don't know if there are other questions. Okay. So, are you looking for the video now, or? Yeah, but I it may it wouldn't wait for me because it might take me a little while. But I'll I'll see what I can do. Yeah, so, yeah, I'm looking. I'm looking actually at my screen, even though it looks like I'm looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. So Ben, you said you've got. What was it? Uh, Twenty-five samples or something? Twenty-two, yeah, had 22. not had. Yeah, but the the process is still ongoing, right? How many are you hoping to get? Yeah, um, so that's a good question too. Um, there's Joe. So Joe, is, you know, put in a proposal years ago to put a magnetometer way back on Curiosity. So this is like something that we've been trying to do for a long time here. Um, yeah, but anyway, big, big question, Ben. Years ago, when they were first discussing the sample return, the Planetary Protection Police wanted to protect Earth by making sure that all materials returned from Mars were heated to at least 600 Celsius. Yeah. How they're did you get to stop time. that? So they're not going to do that this time. You know, like I said, as we're not the only community that fortunately, that wants samples not to be heated. And uh, so, yeah, there's other even more sensitive physical properties like, you know, sulfate stability and things like that that are driving low temperatures. So, yeah, we're lucky that 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 there's actually lots of um, lots of friends in this question to help us out. But in the case of the lunar materials, the first few missions when they came back, they were quarantined for a while. Yeah, And that's the lunar conditions, which are obviously dead. We know that now, clearly, but yeah. I'm not so sure about Mars. Yeah, so they the will... The idea of what the ground protocols are going to be. They're I mean, working on that. I don't know myself. I know they've considered lots of different things, from radiation to UV to probably many other things, but I don't know where they are with that right now. Are they going to build a biohazard three or four facility inside a mu metal shield they're working on defining that in the next year or so um the shielding <laughs> there is a they just put together a measurement definition team two measurement definition team sorry there's no two um and they will be specifying um these sort of high level requirements like can you put a magnet on or not? No, they they've already carried that one, fortunately. So that was something I worked on early on with the with the Mars rovers to basically not expose the samples to figure. I think we're going to use a half a millitesla as the upper limit. Okay, so that they've accepted. But there are other lots of other things like can we CT scan them and that not mess up the magnetism? Can we put them in a shielded room, for example? One thing you know. Um, can we make sure when we take them out that we orient them and don't just like shake it, shake the thing and hope, you know. Um, so that's the all going to be worked out in the next, you know, like I think year to years. I'm, again, I don't speak for the project. This is just sort of people I've talked to. 
and um i believe there is now a paleomagnetist on that uh, board so they haven't announced the team members yet so so i think we are represented as a community on that um and i think once they get going the community this goes back to um courtney's question you know we should as a community work with that board through who, our representative um to make sure that 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 the sample quality criteria for paleo mag and rack mag are are developed in a way that's you know preserves the science that we're interested in so um yeah so that's an important stage in the next couple of years where we should keep our eye on this because then they'll once they've locked that in then they're just going to build it and that's going to take years by itself so really the critical period is next you know year to years so this is again me i'm not speaking for the project this isn't I am not I don't have any special knowledge about um, how they're proceeding, but that's just, you know, typically the way these things work. So. Yeah. Hey, then if there are no other questions. Yeah, I can't find that thing. It's going to take me probably about a half an hour. So maybe no I can worries. <laughs> post it somewhere or send out a link. So, yes, that would be amazing. Thank you very much. Yep. So thanks again, Ben, for for the great talk. We look forward to ten thanks, to twenty years time to see the same yeah, back. <laughs> we'll, we'll we'll think of a way to you know, maybe keep this information flowing about this to the community so that everyone can participate in this um, in, in the next couple of years as it becomes you know uh, as the sample return sample basically laboratory starts to appear and you know be designed. Hopefully, we can influence that some way. So, all right. Great. So yeah, thank you. Thank you very much again. And I will share the screen with the just final um, announcement. So next uh, magnet is the 11th of October with Paula Iglesias Lanos from Buenos Aires. And this talk and the previous talks are gonna be on our YouTube channel. You're welcome to share and comment. And thanks again for, for coming. Thank you.